Hello and welcome to the Northern Broadcasting Show. My name is Cash, I'm the current Minister of Culture and we're very excited to have the show return. For the moment we have Vivanko and Prydania. Um, if Vivanko, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, just a quick introduction. Um, uh, hello, I am Vivanko and I will be uh, just the backup and the uh, technician guy for the recording today. I am not the start, but I almost am. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> awesome. Uh, and we also have Prydania with us. Uh, hello, hello. Uh, it's always great to be on the NBS. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So to start us off today, uh, Prydania, former delegate and Minister of Culture, will be doing a role play reading for us to enjoy. Uh, you, forgot, you forgot my most important position. I was a oh, deputy speaker for one. Oh, term. my. On. I'm, so, I'm, <laughs> I'm so, so sorry. Um, <laughs> OK. So Prydania. Would you yes. like to give the audience some context as to the reading itself and what For the King to Valhalla is? Because I don't know what it is either, and I cannot wait to find out. So, For the King to Valhalla uh, is something that I wanted to uh, challenge myself to write. I started writing it in 2018. Uh, technically, it's still ongoing, uh, which is kind of bonkers, but it is. Um, and the whole idea is, is that it's a story of the Prydanian Civil War, which uh, took place between uh, 20, uh, 2002 to 2017. So it's uh, a, a story that covers over 15 years. Uh, it mostly centers on uh, Tobias Lothbrook, who uh, is in RP canon of Prydania, the current king of Prydania. Uh, and it's sort of follows him because he was seven when the whole thing started and he was crowned at the age of 22 when the war ended so it's, it, it, it's kind of his very interesting coming coming of age story in the middle of the civil war um the the thing about it is that it is um not chronological uh i kind of just wrote the bits as i got inspired to write them uh and so the timeline kind of jumps all over the place but uh, all of the posts are appropriately date stamped, and I will be reading those as we kind of go through this. So, uh, okay, help everyone keep in mind where where we are in the storyline. I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it would be important because I, I think you've also done an RP reading of of this story before, haven't you? I did. Yes, I did. Um, and I'm going to be picking off up where we left off on the last one. Uh, so, if you check out the thread and you listen to that recording and then this one and just follow on through, it'll all be in order. Um, I have I'm, them all. Yeah. Actually, I actually have the whole thing in chronological order on my computer. I opted not to read it that way because the thread is the way that it is, and I wanted anyone who was listening to this who wanted to follow along to be able to you know, do it easily. So we're going thread order, which is kind of all over the place, but we'll manage, I think. Okay, yes. Um, I'm sure it's going to be incredibly entertaining. <laughs> um, Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm looking forward to it. So, um, whenever you're ready, you can begin, I guess. All right, so um, I'm pretty sure this is where we left off last time. Uh, if not, um, we'll just, uh, if not, we'll get a double up, but um, I'm just going to keep going uh, for, you know, as long as the good folks at NBS uh, allow me, and uh, we'll see what happens. But, awesome. So anyone who's following in the thread, we're going to pick up at post number seven. Uh, actually an interesting one, because this takes place post-war, uh, post-Civil War, so that should be fun. Uh, so 15th of September, 2017, 6.04 p.m. on a Friday, somewhere outside, somewhere around Darrow, Prydania. The war was over. Syndicalist insurgents were being hounded. The PGU, the Masordians, they were here. They're helping Prydania rebuild. And someday the war would be forgotten. It wouldn't be for Tobias, though. He'd shaken hands with foreign admirals, corresponded with foreign leaders. 
He'd begun to understand just what it meant to be king, and yet he wouldn't forget this day. The sky was gray, the wind blowing gently across the grassy field, the tree line in the distance swaying. The leaves were beginning to fall. And no one knew he was here to bother no one knew he was here to bother him, to talk to him. Axel knew. He kept his security at a distance. Axel wanted him to have his privacy. So Tobias sat down, his back against an old fence post. Hey, Krista, he said, softly, producing a piece of paper from his pocket, sighing, his eyes heavy. I miss you, he said, breathing deep, wrapping his arms around his knees. Every day, they need me to sign something or talk to someone or shake someone's hand, and it's not so bad, I guess. I mean, I knew this stuff would happen once we won. I can't say I didn't expect it. He chuckled a bit, imagining Krista's smile, the smile she'd have when she'd call him a dummy all those years ago. But I wish you were here to do it with me because you should be here. You should be, he had to hold back the urge to cry. Why? He wasn't sure. He didn't need to save face. Like we talked about how we both used to dream about the war being over, we'd be together. And then he broke down, burying his face in his knees as he wept softly, not even trying to hold back now as he sobbed. He missed her. He had always missed her. But the onset of the fall and the gray skies of September made it worse. He finally composed himself. You'd have liked the coronation, he said softly. It was small and intimate. I know they did it because who wants to invite foreign dignitaries to a bombed out city, right? But it was nice, I think. Just the people who mattered. He sniffed a bit, resting his head against the fence post and looked up. You'd be there and you'd, you'd be queen. I know, it's kind of greedy to think of it like that, right? He chuckled. But we'd be together. He opened up the folded piece of paper he'd been clutching. It was a poem he'd written her back when they were 15 years old and in love. Only seeing each other when the situation of civil war allowed for it. He'd been given the poem back when she died. Died in this field after stepping on a landmine. He wanted to come back here for years, but they never let him. The Goyanians, though, they'd cleared the field. And additional tests indicated that it was safe. And so here he was. Seven years after Krista Brink died, finally able to visit the spot where she died and pay his respects in full. God, this poem is awful. He chuckled, reading the prose of his teenage self. But I guess it didn't have to be good, he said, looking up again. You kept it, he whispered, and you should have it again. He folded the paper up once more, digging into the dirt below him and setting the note down into it before covering it back up. I know it's silly, and you tell me as much. I know it, he smiled softly. But I don't care. I wrote it for you. Let it be part of Eris, the last place you stood on. He fought back the urge to cry again. I'm always going to love you, Krista, he said as he stood, wiping the dirt from his hand. He sighed and looked to the horizon, back in the direction he knew Axel was waiting. He smiled a bit, having finally found closure. Part of him thought it was silly. But why should he need to come around here, this exact spot, to bury some piece of paper in the ground? He'd already said his goodbyes to Krista seven years ago. That part of him, though, he ignored it. He felt a weight removed from his soul now that he had done this. For the first time, he could think of Krista and not worry that there was something unsaid or undone. He stood for a bit longer before taking his flip phone from his pocket, dialing Axel. Yeah, I'm ready. Thank you for taking me out here, he said with a slight smile. He knew his bodyguard would be here in no time to take him back to Beacon City, and he could enjoy the trip back knowing he'd done all he could ever do for the first girl he ever loved. All right, move on. Incredible. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was, uh, I was, I was reading along. I was reading along. Was, thank you, was, thank you. It was good. Do you do you want to do one more? It 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 it's completely up to you. Uh yeah, I'm willing to do as uh, many as you guys are willing to let me. So I can do I can do another one. In fact, actually, I quite like the next one coming up. So um, awesome. Yeah, go for it. We we uh, um yeah that that they, they were shorter than I imagined the individual posts, but I am invested. <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. All right, um, 31st of December, 2015. 11.43 p.m. on a Thursday, Beacons VD, Cridania. So now we're, uh, we're, we're back during the war. War's still going on now. Snow lightly powdered Beacons VD as 2016 drew closer. Everything seemed peaceful, sublime. Even the armed syndicalist soldiers and the bodies hanging from the marketplace's terraces seemed tranquil. The office of the chairman of the Syndicalist Presidium, formerly the Prime Minister's office, was mostly dark, save for a single desk light. Thomas Nielsen relaxed in the chair, holding up a glass of Brennivin, watching the light dance in the sparkles of the clear liquid. Less than half an hour ago, less than half an hour until the new year, and you're all alone. Nielsen didn't even panic. He recognized Jorn Sturdivatin's voice when he heard it. And he wasn't even shocked anymore, nor was he upset. They were close once. No reason they still couldn't have a cordial conversation. Take a seat, Nielsen said gruffly. Pour yourself a drink. Jorn sat, but he didn't reach for the Brennivan. Can I have yours? You don't seem to be drinking it. Nielsen chuckled and sipped. I have a lot of my mind. Like the FRE capturing Haddon and Yannick Liefter? Nielsen grunted. So you're already starting with that, are you? Are you? Well, you've outlawed Christmas, so we can't very well start with small talk about this year's gift exchange, can we? Nielsen smirked. I suppose we can't. So is that why this place seems deader than a morgue? Hatton has your has you lot has your lot in a funk? It has to be that. I refuse to believe that Yannick Leifter was the life of the party. Yannick Leifter's a good man, Nielsen growled, sitting up straighter in his chair. He's a war criminal. You better be right about God being a lie, Thomas. If you're wrong, if your good your good friend will be burning in hell sooner or later. Probably sooner, now that Aubin has him. You come here to lecture me and your old morality, Yorn? Nielsen asked, the tempo of his voice rising. If you did, then you better get out, because I'm not interested in hearing it. No, you only want to talk to me like it was the good old days. And why can't we? Because you're burning the country to the ground. Literally, in some cases. For someone like you, with your skills, your vision is remarkably limited, Nielsen shot back. Everything done is for the good of the people. Sometimes a child must be forced to study their lessons after all. You honestly believe that, don't you? You've known that. You've known that for a long time, Yorn. Since the 27th of May, 2001... Sudvatin replied, his eyes studying Nielsen's features. He looked older. That was to be expected. It had been a while. Still, it was more than time. Stress. It was stress. I told you, you had one chance to stop all of this. I told you then, and there, what would happen was in your hands. And rather than listen to peace and sanity, you went right back to your conspiracies. I did what I did for this country, Yorn. If I knew what I know right now, I'd still do it because it was the right thing to do. It was the right thing to drag people from their homes and murder them in the streets. Class traitors and oppressors don't deserve the people's mercy. It was the right thing to do to hang priests and church girls in their own churches. Nielsen remained silent. Was it right? Was it the right thing to do when you slaughtered Shadais in the streets? Yes! Yes, it was. Even Yorn was taken aback by Thomas's own theory. It was. It was. Nielsen forced himself to relax. You think I lose sleep over any of those people? 
I'd end my life right now if I knew that would mean a peaceful society governed by the principles of equality and fraternity among all of Cridania. Why do you think I care for any of those people if I would be so willing to do that to myself if I thought it would help? The sad thing is that you think by doing all this, you're going to make your vision a reality. Get out. I don't want to be lectured by a man who can't stomach the blood necessary to move the wheel of history. No. What? I'm not done here, and I won't be leaving. What do you want from me, Yorn? What more could you possibly lecture me on? I'm not here to lecture you. I'm here to ask you to surrender. Nielsen chuckled. I think your extracurriculars have scrambled your brain, my friend. Haddon's in FRE hands. And the people there, in the heart of one of the great industrial centers of Prydania, are cheering in the streets. I thought these were your people. Nielsen scoffed. You burnt every farm around Haddon to the ground. Killing Shadaius took a lot of people out of fear-induced apathy. Burning Haddon's farms woke everyone else up. And now you've lost half the country. How long do you think it'll be before everyone else smells blood in the water and joins William Aubin? You're going to lose this war, Thomas. Surrender now before more people die. Ye of little faith, Nielsen mused. I have no faith in a sinking ship, that's true. I have even less faith in a sinking ship that was poorly constructed. Which is funny, because I thought the shipbuilders were some of your loyal followers. They are. We'll, fa we'll fight in the streets of Karis if we have to, but I won't surrender, not now or ever. I won't let the syndicalist dream die. I won't let the bastards who held us in wage slavery for decades and centuries. I won't let them win. If you're still fighting by the time the war gets to Karis, you're truly delusional. No, I have a cause. You just can't fathom I believe in it as much as I do. I never questioned your devotion to your beliefs, Thomas. I just object when innocents die over them. Yorn sighed. Thomas, I warned you 15 years ago. You have another chance at peace now. Don't waste it. 15 years ago, Nielsen chuckled. You're sitting here telling me about destiny, about the path of history, lording over us like some sort of god. This was always destined to end this way. Why bother? Let's kill each other until everyone's dead. Your lot never learns, Yorn chuckled. Before you get upset, I don't mean syndicalists. I mean tyrants. It's a matter of what cause you wrap yourselves up in. Your lot is the same, and you never learn. Toft didn't. Andrews III didn't. You didn't. Don't you dare say my name in the company of those pigs. You're the same, Thomas. You always have been. You never learn. 27th of May, 2001. I told you on that day, history abhorred a vacuum, and that whatever you did after that would be balanced. You think I'm talking about destiny, and I'm not. A war was only inevitable, Thomas, because you made it that way, not fate. And who won that war wasn't in fate's hands either. It was in yours and William Aubin's and hundreds and thousands of other people. You're not losing because fate decreed it. I only said that there would be a counter to you, not that you wouldn't win. Your failings are your own, Thomas. And that wouldn't be so bad that you had to take so many people down with you. Then kill me, Nielsen barked as he stood. If I'm the monster you think I am. Kill me right now, here and now. It was that command that you kill that washed the look of intellectual curiosity off of Yarn's face. He stood, leaning forward, his hands on the desk, looking Thomas in the eyes. When the people who made me what I am did so, they made me make a promise to never kill unless I had to. I happily made it. I also made myself a promise that I wouldn't kill at all. I thought I was clever enough to get out of any situation. I never thought I would be at a point where I had to kill. I managed that for a very long time. Until I retrieved that sword and your men wanted, your men wanted to destroy so desperately. And your soldiers, they killed my brothers. Joran's heart raced, his muscles tensed up, and I realized that I had no choice. There was no way out, so I killed your soldiers, all of them. It. He began to chuckle in a particularly unnerving way. 
It wasn't even hard, Thomas. I just did it. And they died. I did it because I had to. And I killed, still keeping one of my promises. But not my most important promise. He looked directly into Nielsen's eyes. I broke that promise because of you. I have blood on my hands because of you. I won't spill any more on your account. Yorn straightened himself up and turned to leave. Besides, Thomas, your death wouldn't mean anything in the end anyway. Not now. Yorn left the office of the chairman of the Syndicalist Presidium, giving the chairman himself to fall back into his seat. He fumed silently before tossing his mostly full glass against the wall. The sound of shattered glass barely having time to echo before the sound of the clock in the House of Parliament struck midnight. 2016 was here. Amazing. Oh. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you. Yes, that... The whole, the whole, the whole story um, is is captivating. Um, I think I, I think I'll do a bit of reading on my own, and and we should definitely do some more um, RP readings because um, it's very very interesting. Yeah, um, uh, I I do want to apologize. Usually I'm far easier to schedule than this, but this week this week is just kind of crazy, and I kind of have very limited free time. Um, yeah, I, I'm just very grateful that we were able to schedule this um, well, I, for today. I, I, yeah, I do appreciate it, but I do promise you, uh, hand to God, um, if it ever comes to, if you guys ever want to do this again, just let me know, and uh, it'll be a far easier ordeal. I promise you, lad. <laughs> um, I, I will. I will. Now, now I'm familiar with uh, the format and and how how the readings are done. Um, I'm sure there's absolutely tons of potential, and I and I'd be extremely interested in in sharing a lot more of these stories um, that the the role players in in the North Pacific have have written because they they are genuinely very very um, interesting. Oh, we we've got some great writers, and um, yeah, yeah, and. Uh, as a, as an RP mod, uh, I'm I, it, it, it's very heartening. It's very very proud to see it all. We we've got some great some great stuff. Awesome. Well, oh, um, Friday, I, that was incredible. Are you are you going to be staying with us for the news show? Unfortunately, no. Most most of the time, any other day, I would be able to. Unfortunately, I am just a bit pressed for time, so I've gotta I've gotta take off. But. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. Um, again, I know kind of scheduling was kind of crazy, but but thank you for uh, for making it work. Uh, I had a great time, and I'm glad that you guys enjoyed it. So um, I'm going to – unfortunately, I got to take off, but I wish you guys the best. Have a great show, um, and I'll see you all around. No worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys. Thank you so yeah. much for attending the uh, reading, and we'll see you in the next show. Goodbye. <laughs>